This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Good evening, I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. How you doing over there, Rob? Happy spring, everybody. What a lineup we have tonight. Understanding schizophrenics, what teachers know about teaching, how working menial jobs inspired a meaningful book, and so much more. We begin with Tommy Jones. He took a spoken word series about African kings and queens to the next level after he heard a couple of kids on a bus in L.A. talking about how they were going to bust up another kid. That's when he realized he could turn that series into a teaching tool for inner city kids who had little or no guidance at all. The name of his book is Nubia. Tommy. So basically the book is about values, principles, and traits. And it's African kings and queens and their best values, principles, and traits. As we explain through storytelling these values and principles that have been historically proven to lead to success in all types of ways and most of these kings and queens expanded their empires, began engaging in trade with other countries of Africa, not to mention various structures that have been built and designed that are part of the seven wonders of the world, such as the pyramids. We tell the stories of King Hannibal, King Shaka, Queen Nefertiti, Queen Makeda, and Queen Ya Asantewa. So we pretty much cover all the regions of Africa. And it's very entertaining. There's a storyteller called the Griot that kind of leads you on the journey through the African kings and queens. And as he's describing these characters, he's pointing out specific points and key characteristics of success. And the idea is we can become just as successful. It just depends on how we look at ourselves. How do you know about all this stuff? Well, you know, I'm very well educated, of course. I've uh, uh, grown up in the inner city. And I had a tough time coming up in uh, South Central Los Angeles. I really didn't know a whole lot about my own African-American uh, history until I got to Morehouse College. And just like many students in the L.A. Unified School District, we don't get much education about various cultures. Uh, we do learn about Christopher Columbus. We do learn about the slave trade. And that's about where it stops. But the question is, were there great dynasties that existed before the slave trade? And what did those dynasties look like? Also, my father, who was a graduate of uh, Howard University, he always instituted these types of values, especially values of King Hannibal. And he would explain to me how King Hannibal would go and take territory for his own people. I, you know, I was I was watching a program on Black History Month and what a big disappointment Black History Month is because not a lot is really taught about black history. But, you know, this is like a perfect example of something that could be embraced by school systems and make it part of the culture of what we teach in school. Alice, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, you are so you are so true. We turned it into a stage play that in a stage play tours now colleges and universities and various middle schools and high schools. It brings people out of their little shell of being considered to be insignificant, you know, low self-esteem, low self-value, poor judgment. Nubia travels around the country. You've made it into a play. Does the book go with you? Alice, we, we, sell, we sell a lot of books, and it's mostly teachers, pastors, members of the community. The churches, what they're doing is they're handing them out in the community. They got tons of responses back that kids are staying on the straight and narrow, they're graduating high school, they're going to college, they're becoming uh, productive members of society, and they're getting married and they're engaging in holy matrimony. Okay, so when it comes to values, it's already been proven. I mean, we had another church called the Well Church that uh, sent a bunch of books to prison, prison, prisons like Folsom, and we got so many fan mail letters back from prisoners saying that they were just so happy that, that we put that book together for them to have values to stay on the straight and narrow and focus on more so getting out of jail rather than getting more involved with criminal activities inside that's going to keep them there longer. So we've been exclusive to California so far, but we have had various requests from HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, to play their school. We just didn't know how to exactly figure out how to put this, the, the, the tour together. Um, so we've chosen to stay exclusive to California for just for right now until we can put some kind of show like that together. <laughs> well, Tommy, get ready, because after tonight, I have a feeling people are going to be looking you up. You can check out his website, by the way, at Urban City Youth.
Com. Speaking of teaching, before you decide to spend your life in a classroom, you might want to read Matt Macaluso's book entitled Pull Your Head Out of Your Assumptions, What Teachers Know About Teaching. I'm a high school teacher. I teach in Summers, Connecticut, grades 9 through 12 at, uh, at Summers High School. What do you teach? Well, I'm a history teacher. I teach U.S. history, world history, uh, principles of law, trial law psychology, philosophy, they're trying to kill me. So what's your book about? It's a series of interviews with 17 teachers from Massachusetts and Connecticut and New Jersey about their experiences teaching in, in the public school system. And uh, the topics range from, you know, why, why they became teachers to advice that they have for people coming into the business to insights into students and parents and boards of ed and politics, ed reform and all the stuff that's that's really uh, killing us over the last five years or so. Well, what is it that's killing you? <laughs> Where do I start? It, it's the ed reform that, that has really taken root the past five, six years, but has really been sort of in the works in the last 10 to 15 years. I'll, I'll give you an example. All professionals, right, we want goals and, and we want to be better. Uh, we're, we're never really happy with, with our work. Uh, my professional goals went from two goals a year to seven. Uh, and in order to explain those goals, we got an 80-page manual on how to do our goals. Uh, never mind teaching, never mind correcting, never mind assessing, never mind participating as a professional in my, in my learning community. Now we're saddled with goals that came down from on high, from, mostly from people who either a, have no experience in education, or B, uh, were teachers, but frankly don't have the chops to be a teacher, so they go uh, and they work for state boards of ed and they dream up these fun things. The purpose of the book is to really focus somebody coming into the business and ask them, do you really want to do this? You know, are, are you okay with uh, people being on the board of ed that have absolutely no experience in the classroom in making decisions about policy and hiring and firing and uh, are, are you okay with uh, the corporate you know reform movement uh, getting its tentacles into your classroom into your curriculum if you are then that's what you're signing up for uh, you know I've been teaching since 1998 and and up until really about 10 years or so ago uh, it used to be okay uh, but now the corporate reform movement is really awful. And and the whole point of the book is, is to make sure, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I love teaching. I love my students when I can shut my door in my classroom and do what it is that I do best, not worry about, you know, data and, and uh, all of the things that sort of handcuff teachers. Uh, when I can do what I do, what I do best, uh, I'm, I'm in my glory and, and I love my school and I love my students, but it's really a, a, a gut check for people coming into the business and, and parents for that matter to understand what it is that, you know, that, that teachers are going through. Let, let me, let me put it to you this way. You would, you would never see policemen's unions or firemen's unions uh, being put through the ringer the way teachers unions are. Uh, our own governor in the state of Connecticut uh, kicked us in the teeth and said, oh, you know, all you need to do to be a teacher is, you know, show up to work for four years. So I'm asking people, do you want to be in this business with, with the way that it is now? I, a question a lot of teachers are asking, Matt. Thanks. Our next author teaches us a few valuable lessons about schizophrenics. Jeannie Kramer took a page from her life experience, and the title of her book says it all. It's called On Being Schizophrenic. Jeannie. It's a description of my personal experience as a schizophrenic and my description of my experience with the therapy world for schizophrenia that I was involved in. What is it that you think people need to know about schizophrenia? I think people need to know enough to not be afraid of it. I think people need to know that it's an illness. It's not a choice. People don't choose to be schizophrenic. It's a disease like um, diabetes or any other illness. It's thrust upon you, but it um, destroys your ability to think for yourself. You can't think for yourself unless you're on medication? Is that what you mean? Well, it's not quite that you can't think for yourself, but your mind doesn't. You can't really trust your mind. When you're on medication, you can trust your mind more. But the schizophrenic mind it isn't firmly stable in reality. It 
kind of wanders between levels of consciousness, and it doesn't separate other levels from the, ex- the everyday experience. When did you realize you were a schizophrenic? I was about 17. I saw that my friends' lives were different, so there was that observation. I think what's scary about schizophrenia is the people who don't realize they have it, and when bad things happen, you know, criminals go on crazy murder sprees, they find out, oh, Those they're schizophrenic. Those are the only schizophrenic people ever hear about. Exactly. Are the ones that commit crimes. And so everybody thinks schizophrenics are bad people. But generally speaking, schizophrenics are less violent than the general population. When they are violent, they're more likely to turn it on themselves. So that's one of the things people need to know is that schizophrenics aren't by nature violent people. And they're not by nature criminals. But, you know, criminals come from all parts of society, including the mentally ill. Um, But when mentally ill people are criminals, it scares us. And so we, we react. What do you hope to accomplish with this book? I want to educate people to know more about schizophrenia, to understand that it's an illness, to understand it's not a choice. People are not lazy. They're not lingering. They're fighting for their lives. And that's what I want people to know, that people with schizophrenia are fighting for their lives. Could we do more as a society to help schizophrenics and the mentally ill in general? Well, yeah, we could. We could put emphasis on on treatment rather than incarceration, for one thing. And other forms of treatment besides drugs. I mean, drug therapy is very convenient. You pop a pill and, and behave yourself, kind of. But the medication that schizophrenics take in order to suppress their schizophrenic symptoms also suppress their creativity and their emotions and, the, you know, their ability to respond to love and affection. It it puts a kind of a warm, wet blanket over you so that you're not very motivated. You're comfortable, but you're not going to do anything with your life. Although I did write my book while I was on medication. I was just going to say, you managed to accomplish this, and that's saying something, Jeannie, don't you think? Well, I got my master's degree in psychology while I was schizophrenic, and I wrote my book while on medication. So I know that it can be done, but it's a real struggle. I, it was a fight to do any of it. But you did it. I did it. I'm very happy with myself. <laughs> you should be. Have you ever worked at a job you consider beneath you? A job you could do in your sleep? Well, check out this fictionalized version of Jill Johnson E. Palakimo's experience working jobs, uh, let's say, didn't exactly inspire her, and how she made the best of them in her book entitled Menial. Jill. It, oh man, I have such a hard time describing it. It is about a young lady who has just um, a nine to five type of job that is just really boring and she doesn't enjoy herself whatsoever, but it's actually kind of funny because the customer she deals with and her coworkers, the fact that they're so annoying is actually just kind of comical when seen through a certain light. So it's really just kind of a story about working a menial job. Do you have a connection? (laughs) Oh, sure. Well, you know, I've worked any number of jobs that are just sort of that way. Um, Mm. That that kind of perspective on on working a job like that. Why? It's just been kind of what I was qualified for (laughs) or what I was able to get at a young age, just sort of jobs that didn't require too much training and that type of thing when I was that age. Okay, generic office sitcom, you describe it. Yeah. Everything that happens is just sort of dull and mundane, but the perspective is supposed to just be like, this is so kind of lame that it's funny. Does she get out of this situation? Oh, spoiler alert. Yeah, she does. And, you know, the end is sort of like, there's some hope for her. Well, is this one and done? Is this the only book you're going to write? No, I, I have started working on a second book, and it doesn't have a title yet, and it's kind of along the same lines. It's another industry that's just kind of difficult to work in. Um, working as a flight attendant. <laughs> Are you a flight attendant? <laughs> I did do that for a while. How was that? Oh, it was real interesting. Never a dull moment. Yeah, I can imagine. 
I can only yeah. imagine. It was plenty to, of material, I guess. Are you a comedian or something? I am not a comedian. I have two brothers and a sister, and I, I grew up in this house that was just everything is funny. And that's just the perspective because they just cracked me up all the time, really over nothing. I'm, I was in New Orleans for probably about six years working a very serious job. I worked with um, Kip New Orleans, shout out, and um, I kind of lost my sense of humor while I was there because it was, it was very serious dedication stuff. And um, anyway, I got married, so I moved back to New Mexico, and um, I had been wanting to write for quite a while. And I had the time finally, and it was kind of cool to get my sense of humor back. I just would laugh all day long while I was writing this book. <laughs> so it kind of wrote itself. Good for you, because you got to get the giggle back, or life just isn't any fun. Oh, I know. I don't know how I went so long. Yeah, <laughs> what's the matter with you? Jeez. Well, right. that was an interesting time, too. <laughs> well, you're on the right track now, Jill Johnson. Thank you. With that, we are going to take a quick break. When we come back, coping with your fears, a sci-fi adventure, a story of religious hatred, the rise of ISIS, and love. Do not go anywhere. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call for your free author submission kit. Call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. Welcome back to the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini, along with my trusty engineer, Rob Barrett. While working in northern Iraq, Hem Babani was inspired. He tells the story of religious hatred, the rise of ISIS, and love in his book entitled Resonance. Uh, it's about an American journalist who uh, goes to Iraq for a job he's not prepared for, and uh, he's taken hostage to be beheaded. Also, it's combined with a, a brave young Kurdish woman, Jimmy Light, dreams of love, of without violence and uh, religious hatred. She leaves everything behind in order to escape. It's also about the beginning of establishment of the uh, ISIS organization in Iraq. It's a combine between love and cultural and hatred. It's a story that the CIA never talked about it, neither the Iraqi government. That raises that question in my mind to have this published. Uh, at the time when I was in North Iraq, which is back in 2013, uh, I created a non-profit organization named Kurdish Lions Organization. At that time, I was I have had a very close, very close relationship with a number of uh, parliament members and uh, certain individuals who were closely friends, my colleagues, since we were in, in high school. I've been told the story from a very reliable source, and most of them actually were involved in releasing and in the, in the process of uh, pursuing to try to release uh, Martin, uh, they were closely uh, involved. And I have been told the story to uh, these reliable sources. Uh, after this incident, that's when I moved to the United, United States. Uh, through my nonprofit organization, I, I had access to certain information that average people in North Carolina couldn't have this information, especially when it comes to anti terrorism. What's the message here? Actually, the message is very clear. Like, I have dedicated the uh, resonance to all the brave Kurdish men and women who are willing to sacrifice everything in the fight against Islamic extremism for the, for the freedom and equality of all. Is it possible that, that there will be peace there? I believe it will be peace because we're, as human beings, we, we are uh, capable of change. Uh, it's not something impossible. But at this moment, it is the way it is. Uh, violence and hatred is, is rising in the region. Uh, 
uh, and there are certain story, uh, which is very touchy story, need to be heard uh, worldwide. And I did my best to separate the world through uh, this novel. And uh, hopefully my reader will be interested in the next, even the, I'm, I'm actually working on my next novel. Uh, hopefully it will benefit, hopefully it will be beneficial to uh, the American and to everyone around the world. I hope so too, Ham. How to deal with your innermost fears. That's the subject of our next book entitled On Fear's Edge. Vicki Lee, tell us what motivated you to write this book. Oh, it's, um, it's about a little girl named Kelly James and her life growing up in a, a poor Southern family. But the story progressive, and I just wanted to write a story that would um, help other people. You know, they could learn maybe through some of my experiences. My husband died in 1982 with melanoma. Okay. And he was 33. And I wanted to write a story that some way I could weave in his death. At the time, we lived in Miami, Florida, and we were in the sun a lot. We just didn't realize the dangers. You know, we were so, he was so busy having fun, and, and I was that by the time I noticed that the mole was changing colors that he had on his back, I knew we, we were in danger, or he, he was truly in danger. But I wanted to write a story to help other people to help them avoid what we went through with that. The story has been embellished, of course, you know, because I wanted to keep the reader turning from one page to the next. Well, when you say on fear's edge, is that, you know, in fear of what's going to happen next? Yes. Callie, the little girl, of course, in the story, Callie James, she just has a, a, a childhood where she's in fear of a lot of different things has a grandmother who teaches hellfire and damnation, and she has an abusive dad. The most of the fear, though, I think would come from from um, Callie when she grows up and marries a little boy named Jimmy Brown, and he gets the melanoma. She lives in fear of losing him and, and the fear of what she witnesses with his illness. What is it that, you know, we should do? Well, just be aware of the dangers of the sun. Also, um... I speak a lot about child abuse and spousal abuse in the beginning of my story. And, you know, there's there's a lot of that goes on. And women, for some reason, women feel they have to take that, and they don't. And children, I don't think sometimes people are careful enough who they leave their children with. And, and of course, the things, the terrible things that can happen to them. So there, there's just a lot of things I want people to get from my book, you know, the the spousal abuse, the child abuse, the dangers of the son. It, it's a very touching story. I really put my heart and soul into this book, and and I, I just and to, uh, um, you know, prejudice. I think there is some prejudice to, in the world today, and I think that's a sad thing. We're all just people in the same boat, <laughs> and and we're just doing the best we can to get through it. You got that and right, we need, Vicki. We just need to learn to love and care about each other and, and forgive one another. That Those are the things that, that I want my book to bring across to people. We need to be forgiving of one another and love one another and see each other as human beings, you know? Yep. Because we're all just here trying to survive. We all have our problems. Vicki Lee, that is for sure. Finally, before we wrap it up for the night, Darlene Johnson takes us on a sci-fi adventure in her book entitled Monitors of Destruction, the last book in a series, right, Darlene? Yes, it's the fourth one in the series of Monitor books. They are in order, and it shows the monitors have been watching us for eons, and they think that we are an interesting species, but they're not going to take over the world and all of those dreadful things that monsters do. So they came and they, they switch bodies. They take on a human body uh, so that they can walk among us. And they discovered that Yellowstone was about to blow, and they wanted to watch how humankind reacted to a catastrophe like that. So they uh, moved in next door, and uh, we became friends. And that was in the first book. So we, you know, made it through the catastrophic explosion. 
and from bad gangs who wanted to come up from Los Angeles and take over because water had been cut off to, to L.A. But we solved all those problems in the first book. <laughs> and the second book, they discovered some of the terrible reactions f happening from the Yellowstone eruptions, and they also discovered pain. That book is based upon their discovering that we have a lot of pain when somebody dies. Basically, I had to kill off my husband. <laughs> Bet he wasn't so too I happy could, about that, huh? No, he was very happy about that because I was going to go on and have a uh, an affair with Marco Antonio, which is an affair for the next three books. So, yeah, my husband would not be happy with <laughs> Have you published all these books through Page? No, I've published just one of them through Page, the fourth one. And that's where suddenly somebody is bombing us and nobody knows who and nobody knows why, and they're bombing every large city in the world and every military, and they, they've sent a drone. So Marco Antonio has to figure out who this is and what to do about it, and he does. So that's basically the plot of the fourth book. Are the other three books out there? Yes, they are. They're on Amazon. They're e-books. Why did you go with Paige for the fourth book? Because I wanted somebody else to sell it. I am not very good at selling my books. It, it's embarrassing to me. So I thought, no, I want to have a real publisher. Yeah. Maybe you'll end up doing more interviews because you're good at okay. it. Okay. I was a teacher for 37 years. So. All right. There you go, Darlene. Look, I know, I know, I know. I sound like a broken record. But so many authors have had success just by calling the local radio station or newspaper or stopping by the local library and letting people know letting the people know where you live that you're a published author and you've got a story they might be interested in you know it's worth a shot and right now rob and i gotta shoot out of here that's a wrap for another edition of the page publishing book club come on back next week for more authors more inspiration more fun right here same time same place 710 wor have a great weekend <laughs>